Welcome to FilmmakerIQ.com and part two of our journey to modern editing. In the first part, we looked at the accomplishments of video engineers that made it possible to record video signals and edit them. But now the story turns from engineers to programmers, computer scientists, and mathematicians as we look at the explosion of digital and how it made filmmaking accessible to practically everyone. What is the difference between analog and digital? Well, to explain, let's imagine an audio recording of a tone. An analog recording would look like the original sound wave, all the details intact. It's a copy, an analog of the original. On the other hand, pun intended, a digital recording breaks the wave into chunks called samples and then measures the amplitude of the wave at each sample and stores those measurements in a stream of binary code, a square wave of zeros and ones. A digital player will then reconstruct the wave using these measurements. So right off the bat, you may think that analog is the better of the two formats, and you aren't alone in that. There are plenty of people who swear that analog audio recordings are the best. But digital comes with some very great advantages that analog simply does not have. The first is the resistance to noise. Introduce noise to an analog signal and you're going to destroy that signal. Digital signals, because they're either zero or one and nothing in between, can withstand some noise and not lose any quality at all. Digital is also easier to copy. There is no generation loss as analog loses a bit of quality every time it's copied, like a game of telephone. It just slightly changes. Digital signals can also be synced up and read by computers, which analog cannot. And very importantly for video, Patterns can be found in the sequence of ones and zeros in digital signals, so digital can be compressed. And that is the key to making video as ubiquitous as it is today. By the late 1970s and into the 80s, electronics manufacturers were experimenting with digital recording. The first commercially available digital videotape was made available in 1986 with the Sony D1 videotape recorder. This machine recorded an uncompressed standard definition component signal onto three quarter inch tape at a whopping 173 million bits per second. That's a lot of zeros and ones in a single second. In comparison, if you're watching this video in HD, you're seeing it at a bit rate of only five million bits per second. If if that many. The D1 was expensive. The tapes were expensive. Only large networks could afford them. But they soon proved their worth as a rugged format. The Sony D1 would be challenged by Ampex with the D2 in 1988 and Panasonic with the D3 in 1991. Sony would then follow up the D1 with the digital beta format in 1993. DigiBeta was cheaper than D1, used tapes similar to Betacam SP, which was a standard television industry tape at the time, and it recorded composite video instead of component, which was how most TV studios were wired. It used a 3 to 1 discrete cosine transform video compression to get the bitrate down to only 90 million bits per second. Before we dive too deeply into how data is compressed, let's talk about chroma subsampling, a type of compression that was used even on the uncompressed D1 digital video recorder. The human eye is comprised of light-sensitive cells broken into rods and cones. Rods are sensitive to changes in brightness only and provide images to the brain in black and white. Cones are sensitive to either red, green, or blue and provide our brains with the information to see in color. But we have a lot more rods in our eyes than we have cones. 120 million rod cells to only 6 million cones. Because of this, we're more responsive to changes in brightness, which means you can take an image, a color image, and throw away some of the color information while keeping the brightness the same, and it would still look as crisp and as bright as a fully colored image. So to compress color images, first we have to pull the brightness information out of the signal. Now video is made of primary colors, red, green, and blue. But storing video signals in RGB leads to a lot of redundancies. 
So the RGB signal is converted to what's called a YCBCR color space. Y stands for luma or brightness. CB is chroma difference blue and CR is chroma difference red. Together, CB and CR form the color information of the image. Now by separating out color from the brightness, we can start to compress the color information by reducing the resolution of the CB and CR channels. The amount of subsampling or how much we're going to reduce that color resolution is expressed in the ratio J to A to B, where J is the number of horizontal pixels in our compression scheme, usually four, a is the number of CB and CR pixels that were in that sample row, and B is the number of different CB and CR pixels in the next row. Let's illustrate what this means. A 444 signal is said to have no chroma subsampling. There are four pixels in our sample, that's four pixels of Y. Each of those four pixels have their own CB and CR values, so four CB, CR pixels. And in the next line, there are four more CB and CR pixels. Now let's start subsampling. In a 422 subsample, we again have four pixels in our sample, four pixels of Y. We don't throw away any of the Y values. But now we only have two pixels of CB and CR. Two pixels of the Y share identical C, B, and C, R values. In the next line, we again have two pixels of C, B, and C, R. The information needed to construct a 422 image is a third smaller than a 444 image and considered good enough for most professional uses. Another common subsampling is 411. Four pixels in the sample but this time we only have one pixel of CB and CR, and only one pixel on the following line. Here's 420, four pixels in the sample, two pixels in the sample line, and zero in the next line. Essentially those two values of CB and CR get carried over to the next line. Both 411 and 420 need half as much data as 444. Chroma subsampling is a good start, but we have ways to get video data even smaller. Yes, one of the more important ways is the discrete cosine transform. DCT is a seriously brilliant mathematical achievement. Basically what it does is approximates the square wave that is the binary stream as a sum of different cosine waves. Now the mathematics is nothing short of amazing and seriously well beyond my capability to explain. Now in the most simple terms, the more cosine waves you use to describe the square wave, the more accurate you can be. But since digital is so resistant to noise, the little bumps here and there don't affect the quality, so you don't need that many waves to get a very accurate result. A DCT is an important part of every compression scheme. The first compression widely used for editing video was Motion JPEG in the early 90s. Motion JPEG is an intra-frame compression. It uses DCT to break down individual frames into macro blocks. It basically looks at the frame and finds chunks of the image that are similar and simplifies them. Now it didn't look that great. The first Avid editing systems in the early 90s used an early form of motion JPEG compression, and the quality was about that of VHS tape. But since the compression was done frame by frame, the codec wasn't too taxing for the computer hardware at the time, and it was just good enough for offline editing. Now major breakthroughs would come in 1995 with two important technological releases. On the distribution side, 1995 saw the introduction of DVD optical discs. These discs were used in a new kind of compression called MPEG-2, not to be confused with motion JPEG. Now MPEG-2 was developed by the Moving Pictures Experts Group, who had a rather novel approach to handling compression. See, instead of standardizing the way that video signals were encoded, they standardized the way video was decoded from a digital stream. So 
the way an MPEG-2 was decoded stayed the same no matter where it was done, on a DVD player, on your computer, or even a modern day DVR. Now how that data stream was encoded, how it was created, what algorithms were used to compress the original data, that was left open. So that media companies could constantly fight it out and develop more and more efficient encoders. MPEG-2 was an interframe compression. Unlike intraframe, which compressed frames individually, interframe compression puts frames into GOPs, groups of pictures. These GOPs would start with an iframe or a reference frame, a full image. Then the encoder would wait a few frames and then record a P frame, a predictive frame. This frame only contains the information that is different from the I frame. Then the encoder goes back and calculates the difference between the I and the P frame and records those differences as B frames or bi-directional predictive frames. Describing this process almost sounds like magic. I mean, building frames based on reference frames and then how they change, that's very computationally taxing. It would take a while before computers could muscle the processing power to edit this kind of compression. But in 1995, they didn't have to, as that was the same year the DV format was introduced. Intended to be a consumer-grade videotape format, DV recorded video at a 411 color subsample using intraframe DCT compression, giving 25 million bits per second. Quite an improvement in size from the original D1 tape. Now, this wasn't considered a professional quality standard, but it was a huge step up from the consumer analog formats like VHS and Hi8. And all DV cameras had IEEE 1394, Firewire. So that means people could actually get a perfect digital copy of their video onto their computers for editing without having specialized hardware to encode the file. The DV tapes themselves were extremely cheap, three to five dollars per hour. Armed with relatively inexpensive cameras, digital video production began to take off. In Hollywood during the 90s, Avid was the king of nonlinear editing systems, but it was still a fairly expensive system. Several companies tried to compete for a share of that video production market. Beginning in 1990, NewTek released the first video toaster on the Amiga system. Though technically it was more of a video switcher, which had limited linear editing capabilities until they added the flyer, Video Toaster brought video production to lots of small television studios, production shops, and schools. Costing just a few thousand dollars, but loaded with effects and character generators and even a 3D package called Lightwave 3D, Video Toaster proved that there was a market for small-scale media production. So unleash your potential. Infiltrate the networks. Make money. Make a statement. And whatever kind of television you make, make it yours with the Video Toaster 4000. As computers continued getting more powerful and storage cheaper and cheaper, software-based non-linear editors like Adobe Premiere Pro and Media 100 kept nipping at the heels of the Goliath Avid, forcing the company to constantly release systems that were cheaper and cheaper. Now, a media company called Macromedia wanted to get into the game. They hired the lead developer of Adobe Premiere, Randy Ubilos, to create a program called KeyGrip, based on Apple's QuickTime Codex. The product was fairly developed when Macromedia realized it was unable to release the program as it interfered with their license agreements they had with TrueVision and Microsoft. So Macromedia sought a company to buy the product they had developed, and they found one at a private demonstration at NAB 1998. The buyer's name was Steve Jobs, and his company was Apple, and they would release the software in the following year, 1999, as Final Cut Pro. The divide between television video production and film production began to close with the adoption of high-definition video production. Engineering commissions had been working on the standardization of high-def video since the 70s, and experiments with HD broadcasts were being conducted in the late 80s in Japan. 
The first public HD broadcast in the United States occurred on July 23rd, 1996. Now, about the same time, the mid to late 90s, Hollywood studios were beginning to use DI, or digital intermediaries, to create special effects. A DI is created by sending 35 millimeter film through a telescene, which is scanning the film and creating a digital file. These files could be manipulated in the computer with special effects and compositing, and when the director was satisfied, they would send the file to an optical printer who would put the digital images back onto film, hence the term digital intermediary. Now, in 1992, visual effects supervisor producer Chris Woods overcame several technological barriers with Telecine to create the visual effects of 1993's release of Super Mario Brothers. Over 700 visual effects plates were created at 2K resolution. That's roughly 2,000 pixels across. Chris Watts further revolutionized the DI process with 1998's Pleasantville. Pleasantville held the record for the most visual effects shots in a single film, as almost every shot when the characters visit this fictitious 1950s idyllic town of Pleasantville required some kind of color special effects. Okay, right here. All right, stop. Stop! Where is it? Whoa! Hey, here, grab the nozzle. Well, where's the cat? Come on, just hold on tight. Whoa! So that's what these things do. The first Hollywood film which utilizes the DI process for the entire length of the movie was the Coen Brothers' Oh Brother Where Art Thou in 2000. After trying bleach processes but never quite getting the right look, cinematographer Roger Deakins suggested doing it digitally with a DI. He spent 11 weeks pushing the color of a scanned 2K DI, fine-tuning the look of old-timey American South. Appears to be some kind of a congregation. Care for some gopher? No, thank you, Delmer. A third of a gopher would only arouse my appetite without bedding her back down. Oh, you can have the whole thing. Me and Pete already had one. We ran across a whole gopher village. The thing is, HD video and 2K film scans share roughly the same resolution, HD being 1920 by 1080, whereas 2K is 2048 by 1080. So it wasn't long before Hollywood started to ask, can we just skip this whole 35 millimeter film step altogether? The first major motion picture shot entirely on digital was Star Wars Episode II, Attack the Clones in 2002. And it was shot on a pre-production model of a Sony HDW F900. And by the last half of the 2000s, with faster computers and better storage, better cameras, and even 4K resolution, it became conceivable to capture straight onto a digital format. Edit the video online, which means working with original full quality files rather than low quality working files, and even project digital files in the movie theater, all without celluloid film. Moving into the second decade of the 21st century, we're adding even faster computer and video processors, incredibly efficient compression techniques like MPEG-4 and H.265, and a powerful network of data distribution with broadband internet, capable of sending video across the globe. The journey to get to modern day film video editing can trace its way all the way back to TV networks needing to delay the broadcast of their shows. Everything we have now is built on the sparks of genius that electronics engineers and software engineers and mathematicians had over the past 60 years, coming up with incredibly brilliant solutions to problems that hounded electronics from the start. Each step, each advancement, adding more and more tools for us filmmakers to realize our dreams. 
How can you not look at the momentum of history and how we got here and not wonder in awe that so much has changed in so little time? And it's all so we can just tell stories to one another. And filmmaking is the technological fulfillment of our most basic human need, the need to communicate. So go out there and communicate. Use these tools that are available to you. Be part of the next chapter in filmmaking history. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at FilmmakerIQ.com. <laughs>